Our primary mission here at Alternate Media is to bridge the gap between Judaism and Christianity as it's existed for far too long. Yeshua, as we know, never intended to start a new religion. He was a religious Jew. I think that's a certain point in every believer's life where we think, isn't there more? There has definitely been a need within the church. That's something that a lot of Christians are searching for. A lot of Christians know that there is something missing in their faith. What indeed is intended to fill that is Judaic roots of the faith. The New Testament is very clear about bridging the gap between Jew and Gentile, and we're just returning that mission back to the modern day. Shalom and welcome everyone to our fifth part of this oral Torah debate review that I've been doing with David Costello from Ahavas Um I, I think we're we're probably going to be able to wrap it up this time. I think we're 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 most of the way through it. I think we're kind of at the tail end with some final remarks, some uh, probably a little bit of Q and A back and forth, uh, maybe even some audience Q and A. I can't remember if they do an audience Q and A. It's 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 been a a little bit since I've watched this uh, to prepare for this, but without further ado, let me bring up my guest as, as per the previous parts. How are you doing this evening, brother? Baruch Hashem. Well, wonderful. Wonderful. You, um, I, I, I'm going to pick up the same place that we left off. I, I think uh, it was, and I'm pretty sure Rabbi Eduardo was like just wrapping up, I think in his, uh, what was his uh, final statement? I think we finished on on final statements last time. Um, but before we get into that, uh, wh what are you drinking tonight, sir? <laughs> Some of our uh, homemade wine. So uh, from the Wisconsin grapes. So we made some of it and bottled some of it. And so I'm drinking some of it. That's got to be delicious. I've got to yeah, I've, I've, I've got to attempt that one of these days. One of these days, I'll try and make my own wine. <laughs> Uh, for me currently, I'm still trying to get rid of, uh, you know, the chametz that's in my house. So I, I, I gotta, I gotta work on that and, uh, make sure that that's gone before, uh, Pesach. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what a burden, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, let me, uh, bring up the video here and, uh, as per usual, if there's a place that you want me to stop. Go ahead and tell me to stop. Okay. Let's see. It'll probably give us an ad. Okay. Oh. Wow. Thank you guys so much for uh, the spirited discussion. It was awesome. It was excellent hearing both sides of this. Um, and honestly, we, we need we need more of this. I would love to learn more about this this oral law concept and how important it is to the to the Jewish community and stuff like that. Um, well, so we just ended uh, the debate section, guys, and now we're going to go into the questions, the Q&A. Um, uh, I have some people already listed that have had their questions already ready. You guys can keep uh, bringing in these questions because we have some time. OK, so bring in these questions. Um, someone perfect had, timing. Yeah, it's perfect timing. Uh, Tippy asked about whether or not uh, David was, you know, why he objected to Jesus being the Messiah. So we clarified that you are messianic, that you do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Yes. And so, yeah. So just wanted to clarify, guys, he is messianic. He believes that Jesus is the Messiah. So we have a question for you, David, uh, from Isaiah uh, Chavez. His question is, where was the oral law in Second Kings 22? Why was Josiah so horrified when they rediscovered the Torah, the Torah scroll if they had an unbroken aura, oral Torah from Sinai? Wow. This is There's new. a rad. Yeah, switch to yeah. H&R Block. Okay. Doing my own taxes like a champ. You can um, Because the words of the Torah are precious. Um, if you uh, go into any Jewish synagogue, you will see a safer Torah um, these are precious things. They're counted as um, as a person, right? So there's this idea of oral Torah, right? You can do things and not know why you do them. Um, I actually think that this is uh, the case in a lot of the um, sort of Christian world 
uh, the Pope wears a kippah. Why does he wear a kippah? You know, you don't know why you're doing it necessarily. Uh, I talked to an Anglican priest. Why do you put the water into the wine before you do communion? Um, the, 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 and he gave me, I don't know. We just sort of do it. And so there is a tradition that you can do, but not know why you're doing it. Um, knowing why you're doing it, getting to that Sefer Torah, the, the holiest thing in all of Jewish expression is incredibly exciting. Um, and, and that would be my answer for that. All right, is that, yeah, yeah, is that what the is that what the before before he gets into that? I'm just curious. Would you answer that differently today? Yeah, probably. Um, I mean, finding the safe the the safer Torah is an incredibly important thing. Um, do I think that they lost it in, in a sense of like losing it, losing it? I, I don't know if that's necessarily the case. So I probably would answer it a little bit differently. Um, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head. Like, I don't think that they actually lost the Torah, but I do think that finding a safer Torah is an exciting thing. Um, right. But I don't think that, that the, I, I think I kind of gave the idea that they did something without knowing why they were doing it. I don't think that's a hundred percent correct. Um, right. I, you know, the, when I think about that, cause it's just, it's just so I, I would dare say even illogical to think that they were living apart from Torah and without Torah for really any exorbitant amount of time. Um, and then finding, finding a Torah scroll, uh, and having to relearn how to do all of that. I, I it just doesn't, it, it doesn't seem rational to me. Uh, it's probably more likely that, they were maintaining Torah practice uh, by tradition and finding this Torah scroll was, you know, so as wonderful as it is to find a Torah scroll, but also this was confirming practice that they had been doing based on tradition for generations. Yeah. You know, and this is a, the, even, even that that's granting that they had lost Torah entirely. And that this, so this was the first yeah. Torah scroll that had ever been found in, in however long, you know, that's, that's a whole lot of stuff that's being read into the text. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's lots of Torah scrolls is maybe this Torah scroll in the temple um, may have maybe a bit of significant, more significance than the other Torah scrolls that existed. But yeah, I don't think it was the only Torah scroll. And so I think I, I sort of, answer that incorrectly in that sense but yeah i gotcha yeah well i i he, rabbi eduardo is getting ready to to press you on that answer so let's the passage says though all that extra stuff that you added or does it say that he found the book of the law he found the book of the law okay so it's not what you just said well i mean stuff. if you were to say that they lost the book of the law then you would say that they lost the the torah and the Chumash as well um, uh, and I mean, I I'm not making a claim, but I'm just saying, does the Tanakh say that they found the book of the law? Um, they found the book of the law. Yeah. Okay. So is it what you just said? Yeah. I said they have a great joy of finding the book of the law, the, the, the written law of Moses, one of the five books. I, what was the point of that? <laughs> I don't know. The, so it just like. It's like he was so desperate for a win, right? That like what like what was the point of that? It it at this point it's it's it it seems pretty obvious that at, he's really just trying to shame you, right? Because right. his his question was not relevant to the subject of oral Torah. Uh, that's why uh, that's why even after you answered it and just agreed with him, yeah, okay, it says that he, that he found the Torah, right? Okay, so he had nowhere to go from there. Uh, there, there, like there wasn't some alternative point that he could drive at. He, he was just, he was just looking to try and make you wrong. Right. Right. It did nothing to support his premise. Right. I mean, I, I even sort of said it in my response of like, well, then you said they lost the Chumash and everything else. Like, how can you then rely upon anything? Right. Um, <laughs> like you have nothing. So yeah, I mean it, it, 
yeah, it didn't make a lot of sense at that point. And I, we just sort of went in a circle and I just sort of was like, okay, we'll, we'll keep doing this. Right. Sure. I mean, yeah, it doesn't, it, it says they found the book of the law. It doesn't say that they lost the law entirely either. Again, this is something that, that he would assume onto the text. Right. So, uh, that's, that one's funny to me. Did you want to make a statement on that rabbi or is that, it? that's it? Okay. All right. Um, the next question that we have, uh, it's from Isaiah again. He says, what do you feel uh, about the seat of Moshe in Matthew 23, 2? I'm surprised that didn't come up. Yeah. He says, is this about the oral law or is this the seat that they read Torah from in the synagogues? Who's the question for? It's uh, for David, I believe. Okay. Okay. But either, either of you can, you know. So, yeah, I'm surprised it didn't come up either. Um I had other things that I was researching, and I guess they got well, it'll set my mind. Yeah, I mean, this is a really good argument for why we should keep the oral law. Um, he says that you should do as they say, not as they do. Um, he is here recognizing the authority of the oral law. When he submits the crucif crucifixion, he is also admitting to the authority of the sages and the rabbis. Um, you always go by majority, whether or not they are right or wrong. Um, the issue with uh, behaving as they did is an issue which Yeshua is trying to, in my opinion, correct, uh, to bring the full geula, in which we're still sort of dealing with, which is why my organization is called um, Achavah Sinem. The one of the main issues of the generation of Yeshua was Sinat Chinam, uh, was baseless hatred. And so he is arguing against that. And so he's saying, don't, don't do as they do. Don't have baseless hatred, but do as they say. Keep the strictures of the laws. He says in Matthew 23, 35, you should tithe mint, dill, and cumin, which is a stringency uh, recorded in Nida 49 and 50, and which is still a, a, a stringency that is talked about today as being a very high level of stringency. He says, you should have done all these things and not neglected um, the weightier manners of the law, right? So there's a, a story in a Talmud of uh, two rabbis at the time of Yeshua, or two, two Kohanim at the time of Yeshua, and the law is, is that if you stab someone with a knife, once the person's dead, then the knife becomes a father of Tuma and can pass on Tuma to other things. And the basic impurity, impurity, so people know. Impurity. Huh? impurity. Impurity, sorry, yeah. Uh, the impurity. And so um, one of the things that I think Yeshua was talking about, don't do as they do. The, the father of the son who is dying out um, said, wait, he's not dead yet, so the knife hasn't contracted impurity and can't impart impurity to other things, use it to sacrifice. And so for me, that would be the uh, don't do as they do, but do as they say, right? So he says, keep the stringencies of tithing mint, dill, and cumin, which is a stringency found in Beit Shemai, um, uh, proposed by a Shemuti in, in what we have as a Talmud. Um, and so he says, keep the minutia of the law, but also have middos that is compassionate and caring and care more about the saving of life than care about the transmission of Tuma. Tuma was a very, impurity was a very big thing um, at the time of the Tinnium. And so um, it was a very, it was something that was, it comes back to the washing of hands as well. Um, it was a very, very um, decisive, uh, divisive sort of argument going on within house, within the, the uh, Orthodox or within that's, anachronistic within pharisaic judaism at that time um and okay. so, so we're just I, okay so so uh, let's give radar apologetics a chance to so, address um, some of what was said in the question yeah thank you very simply the pharisees did sit in the seat of moses at the time of yeshua okay and what happened paul was a pharisee so were the disciples they were all pharisees so we're not but what matthew 23 doesn't um um expressed to us is which pharisees sit in the seat of moses it says the pharisaic movement sits in the seat of moses and then yeshua funnels that down based upon luke chapter 7 and other passages to his disciples that which are the pharisees that sit in the seat of moses we know from luke chapter 7 i can't stress it enough if you reject what god was doing at that time period you will forfeit god's purpose for your life i believe god had a purpose for the pharisees but then it goes on that he goes down to a specific group of pharisees and then with the gospel he gives authority to others i will stress this though uh rabbi um i was gonna say rabbi david david costello brings down all over the earth god is raising up a new breed of wealth builders who'll use their money to shape the course of world history to us <laughs> the idea of positivity about 
the traditions of the Pharisees, but this is not the only position. Yeshua, Jesus himself says that the, because of the traditions of the Pharisees, they nullify the word of God. What does that plainly mean? That means that the traditions of the Pharisees aren't the word of God because the word of God can't nullify the word of God. And this is important and we need to understand that. Okay. Did I get to respond there or no? I don't I don't I don't think you did. I, I think he moves on from there. Um hang on, let me let let me let it play a little bit further and we'll see if he lets you. Thank you so much for that. All right. So we have Yeah, okay. So he's not going to let you. Um <laughs> so there's a lot to unpack in that one. Uh, first of all, I don't think that he really answered the question, right? Right. He, he said that the, the, the Pharisees sat in the seat of Moses at the time. Now, that could be taken uh, to be an agreement with the position that the seat of Moses was a physical seat uh, that the Pharisees would sit on to read the Torah, the written Torah. Um, he, he doesn't he, he doesn't really say one way or another. Um but that's again, you have to add to the text in order to make that case. Uh, Yeshua doesn't say the scribes and Pharisees sit on Moses' seat for now, right? He says they 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 sit in Moses' seat. Um, the subject of of Moses' seat is a, a fascinating one, in in my opinion, because if we if we try and use this this idea that. Well, it was a physical seat where you would sit down and you could only read the written Torah, right? Without explanation, you know, because that's how honored and respected the seat was. It was the seat of Moses. And so only Moses could be read there. And then if you were going to expound, you had to stand up or find another seat or something like that, you know, but you could only read the written Torah from Moses from the seat of Moses. It's like, okay, but like where in the written Torah is that? Right. Right. <laughs> that in and of itself would be oral Torah. So like either way, you're still arguing for a tradition at this point. Um, yeah. And uh, it, there's aside from that, there's just really no historical evidence for that. Wait, there's there's the one the one bench that was found at the Corsine synagogue, um, which is a, a very late synagogue i mean we're we're on the border of the medieval period at the, at the time that the synagogue is constructed you know uh, it it's it that synagogue wasn't around when yeshua was and we have multiple excavations in multiple synagogues that were around at the time that yeshua was around and none of them have this seat so right. <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah i mean the the other thing that is inherent in that which um folks sort of in his camp sort of want to run away from as much as possible, but he's fundamentally arguing both one, a Sadducean argument, which if you're interested, go and read the gospels and you'll find out how Yeshua feels about the Sadducees. Um, but he's also arguing fundamentally then on the Pharisaic side, he's arguing for uh, replacement theology. The church is fundamentally the Pharisees that replace the Pharisees that existed at Yeshua's time. I mean, that was his whole line of argument. And it really is really, really interesting to me. I mean, this came to me way, way, way back when, when I was in a Christian seminary. And I realized um, that this, these are two sides of the same argument. This sort of, um, the, the place like him and, and uh, Dr. Brown come from, um, Rabbi Abordo and Dr. Brown, they are, they're arguing so hard against replacement theology, they can't see this replacement theology themselves as far as how they hold. And it's right. really mind-blowing to me. <laughs> yeah, he, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, trying to deposit this notion that, yeah, the Pharisees were, you know, they, they were in charge at the time, uh, but Yeshua gave his own disciples authority and he intended for that to uh, circumvent uh, the, the authority of the Pharisees, ultimately, it's like, okay, so you just made the argument for papal succession, right? right? For, for apostolic succession and papal authority. You made that argument, right? So now with that understanding, you explain to me why Catholics and Orthodox Christians are incorrect about their understanding of apostolic succession, right? right. The onus is on you now because you're the one who used their own argument to say, there's a new authority. <laughs> right. I mean, they, they don't realize it's a Catholic. I mean, this is 
sort of widespread in sort of even the messianic in the messianic world and a larger broader christian world is there's so much that comes from catholicism and everybody who is arguing against it just doesn't realize it because some of the things that they say about about catholics are the same things that they'll say sort of about what i'm what what i behold to and what i believe in um but they but they're actually using so much catholic structure or orthodox christian structure to support their arguments that you either have to then convert to be catholic i guess <laughs> or eastern orthodox right. or just sort of i don't know abandon faith altogether i'm not sure exactly um if they wrestle with that where that would come where where that would come to for them uh but it it is completely lost. I mean, it's just sort of a blind side um, on their part is, is that they're actually arguing for that argument. He, he also got uh, a bit of his, uh, his history incorrect. Uh, what he finished there explaining how, well, you know, Yeshua also uh, accused the Pharisees of nullifying the commandments of God with their traditions. Right. O okay. And, and uh, my colleague Seamus this is one of his favorite bits to, to go over because that's actually not true. Um, it, it, what, what's being discussed there, um, and interestingly enough, if you, if you read very carefully and understand the historical context of what's happening, the actual Talmudic Midrashic discussion of what's happening there, not Midrashic, uh, Mish Mishnaic, um, then it, it would actually seem that, uh, what Yeshua is arguing for is actually referring to oral Torah as the commandment of God. Okay. Because the ruling of the sages was that a man could deprive his mother and father of whatever he claimed as Korvan. The Pharisees disagreed with that and ruled that, that that's not the case. Right, that ruled that honor your father and mother takes precedence over that. That's a Pharisaic ruling. It is oral Torah. Like Yeshua literally argues for oral Torah and calls it the commandment of God. Right. Right. Because effectively, what you have here is two commandments of God that are at odds. Okay. That's the first thing people need to recognize uh, is that this was this was not a tradition. Right. That was that was under attack here. Um, the the commandment of of God says that that which is Corbin belongs to Hashem, right? Right. That so that that belongs to Hashem. Uh, the the Torah also says to honor your father and mother. Um, but what if your father and mother are destitute and they need your financial assistance? Uh, but the only financial assistance that you have is money that has already been promised to Hashem. Right or or even what whatever kind of goods whatever goods they they would they could gain from you is something that has already been promised to Hashem it is korban, okay can you give it to them or is it it a strict Sadducean a strict Torah only right written word only interpretation of this commandment would be well no your parents can't have that they have to give it to you know you have to give it to Hashem it's got to go to the temple it's got to go to the Kohanim. Uh, it's funny. I actually had this discussion with somebody, and I presented this case to him. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't talk about what passage of 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 the New Testament we were discussing. Right. I didn't bring that discussion up. I just said, okay, here's the scenario. Okay, the scenario is this commandment, right? And I gave the 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 scriptural citation. I don't remember what it is for right now, um, but I gave the scriptural citation regarding korban and what belongs to Hashem. Uh, and and I said, okay, so consider this commandment and your parents need your assistance and the money that they need, which is essentially the only money you have left at this point, uh, is that which you have promised to Hashem. Um, what, according to the written Torah, what are you supposed to do, right? Uh, do you, do you make sure to give it to Hashem to, to give it to the Kohanim to, to take it to the temple or do you give it to your parents? And he actually said, I'm not kidding. He said, well, you'd be obligated to take it to the Kohanim. Said, okay. You just made the argument that Yeshua is arguing against in this passage. 
Right? Because see, it's oral Torah that says, well, no, honoring your father and mother takes precedence over this. So the money has the, the money should go to your, your mother and father. And Yeshua says that that is the commandment of God. So <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, and then it's it the yeah, I that's getting into a whole other sort of thing of worms. I mean, as far as the rabbis being able to sort of determine these things is completely oral law. I mean, you sort of, you talked about that already. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it happens all over the place um, in the gospels. I mean, it's just almost nonstop if you actually sit down and look at it. Um, but it's just really the literacy in just basic, even, so the scriptura people in scripture and in, in Tanakh and what it means there, um, just actually knowing what it actually says, um, I find something that needs to be addressed as well. Right, right, and and I think at, at the core of that of that particular passage, one of the one of the bigger problems is that uh, people read um, the sages or the elders, and they automatically project the Pharisees onto these titles. When that that's not the case, and and you know, historically speaking, uh, even the Talmud distinguishes between these two groups. Right, right. But the sages are, are like a full generation ahead of the Pharisees. Yep. But let's, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll press on and see what what comes up next. Another question by Hans Twilight. He says. Uh, this question for you, David. Is there any archaeological discovery concerning the oral law in the books of the law? So you're talking about an archaeological discovery of the oral law in the books of the law. I'm trying to understand exactly what you're trying to get at. I think, I think this question is probably um, whether or not do, do any of the manuscripts of the book of the law, any scrolls of the books of the law, that we found or discovered, do they ever mention this oral law? Um, so I'm not up on what's been discovered archaeologically. Um, I can say that there are made mikvahs that have been discovered. So if you're looking at archaeological uh, understandings of how to make a mikvah, um, we, you can go to the Temple Mount and you can see um, mikvahs which obey the laws of of mikvah even today um at the temple uh, underneath the temple mount and around we, we do have examples of mikvahs that are constructed according to oral law i'm not sure exactly how far those go back um i believe they're at least at the time of the temple what are mikvahs uh, the, huh what are, what are mikvahs mikvahs are um ritual baptismals i guess you'd say yeah um so it doesn't collect. like so it doesn't like this. It's not in the books of the law, though. It's not or in the like, books of the law. Their their okay. their construction uh, specifics are not in the books of the law. Um, okay. This is this is this is rabbinic in origin. Okay. Um, uh, the specifics as how as to the how these are to be constructed. Um, and so, 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 we, so we so do far have as... archaeological evidence of um, of ritual immersion like mikvahs. Uh, so yeah. as as far as you know, as far as you know, there's no. Um, but as far as you know, there's no mention in any of the, the you know, the scrolls of the books of the laws that we have um, that mention this oral law. Join Planet Fitness and get energized with fitness that fits your budget. Deal ends April 12th. I paid off $495,000 in debt within 18 months using what I now call my. I had no idea you're talking about as far as like the. We were talking. What were you saying? I have, I have no idea what he means by archaeological findings in the books of the law. I still don't know so, what that means. <laughs> it, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll explain it. I, I understand what he's asking. It's just a dumb question uh, because you could you could literally just ask, okay, does the Bible ever you know, do, does the does the written Torah ever mention the oral Torah? Right. Yeah. All over. What he's what he's asking is. Is the oral Torah ever mentioned in any of the ancient manuscripts of the Torah that we currently have today? Oh, okay. That's that's what he's asking. And those manuscripts are not any different from the Masoretic text that we have today. 
All right. I, not enough to not not enough to to warrant any kind of extreme critique. Oh, so he's looking at like the Dead Sea Scrolls or something. Which okay. honestly, the Dead Sea Scrolls, interestingly enough, they do mention a, a, a plethora of other traditions. Uh, not all of them would be considered oral Torah. Some of them would be considered, uh, you know, Essene tradition. Um, but but yeah, that that that's essentially what he's asking. Okay. And I would. This is clearly a question that is asked from someone who uh, I'm, I'm going to make two observations immediately. Number one, can't read Hebrew. Um, and. Uh, number two doesn't understand even where the written Torah references the oral Torah because it does in numerous places, right? right? But not being able to read Hebrew is a big part of that because this person probably assumes that the, that the written Torah is written in, in perfect Hebrew, right? In perfect Hebrew grammar and syntax and spelling, right? Because the Bible is perfect. It can have no imperfections because somehow that makes God lesser, <laughs> Right. Right. And so it's going back to this thing. I mean, if you look in the scroll behind me, um, which is from our Safer Torah, you see the Tagen on it. it. I mean, and those go back as far as we've had Torah scrolls. Right. I mean, you have the oral law literally written into um, any scroll that you would have, even of the Torah. So, right. yeah, if I had known who was asking, I might have had a better answer than that. But, yeah. Okay. So yeah, the, the way that it was asked was a bit confusing, but that's I from at least I think I'm correct in in assuming that that's what he meant, right? Okay. So from from the ancient manuscripts that we have of of the Torah, is the oral Torah ever referenced? And the answer is yes, because it's referenced in all the same places that it's referenced in a, a modern, you know, Masoretic, uh, you know, right. the stone edition Tanakh. It's referenced in all the same places. Right. <laughs> okay. Fair enough. Yeah, but I as far as archaeological evidence though, I like that you used mikvah because that's a that it's such a good I mean, how do you how do you make a mikvah, right? <laughs> if if you read the written Torah only, then like people would be trying to find, you know, natural bodies of water, uh, you know, rivers or even the ocean. And and not that not that those are unacceptable. I mean, you clearly we see uh John the Baptist and Yeshua himself doing this in a river. Um, but When it comes to, to to making right a mikvah, like what do you do? You just dig a hole in the ground, right? And that's it. You call it good. Hole in the ground. Thumbs up. <laughs> We're calling it good. You did everything that you know. Like the fact that mikvahs from back then follow the exact same uh, restrictions and the the exact same formula. They're 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 built to the standard that we know exists in the oral Torah today. It tells us that that those standards were in practice back then at that time. Yeah, you know, and that's not the only one. There, there really there are more archaeological evidences of this. There's there's the the archaeological evidences of Hanukkiahs, you know, going back as far as like the first and second century. Um, you know, so they, they they may not look the same as the ones that we have today, but we know at the very least, well, like we know what they are and we know what they were used for. You know. Um, so clearly Hanukkah was being practiced back then in spite of what some people may argue. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, it's mentioned in John 10 um, as well. 1030, I think. No, it's not 1030. 1022. 1022, yes. Yeah. Yes. 1030 is a different one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's, let's see what comes next here. Uh, I, I, I got a feeling... Uh, Maybe Rabbi Eduardo will have a response to that. Let's see. We're talking about like the Dead Sea Scrolls kind of thing. Sure. Yeah. Um, not that I know of as far as it mentions oral law, but I do, okay. but we do see it from archaeological evidence that the rules were applying. This is this is the same thing that I'm trying to make with the New Testament. We do see these rules being in play, and so therefore we have to understand that they existed. Um, the New Testament itself is a good proof that these things were going on at the time because of the types of discussions that were being had. 
All right. Radar Apologetics. Uh, I'll just throw this out there. I don't remember exactly what the question is, but uh, there's there's no evidence that there was an oral Torah. Uh, all that's evidence, even by these mikvahs, is that people had traditions of washing ritualistically. The, there is a jump in the presupposition. This is the oral law. And David made a mistake like he made many times throughout this debate. He anachronistically projects the rabbis back into the time of the Pharisees. So mm -hmm. we do have in the first century mikvahs, which were ritual baptismals, uh, where there were washings happening. The Essenes did it. But the Essenes, remember, are not part of the chain of transmission in the oral law. So they had some baptismals. They had things that they did. But when we look at the writings of all the Jewish groups around them, Everyone understands that the Pharisees had their traditions, which were the traditions of the elders. But there is no way that you can prove that this was the oral law that later becomes rabbinic. Just because they're same doesn't mean the same thing. Just because you can find a correlation between them doesn't mean there's a one to one equation with the traditions of the fathers along with the oral law. Now, if you believe that the traditions of the fathers, the traditions of the elders indeed is what becomes the oral law, then you cannot believe in Yeshua because Yeshua says your traditions nullify the word of God. It depends. So first of all, let's let, let's just address one thing that I absolutely cannot stand is when people take a statement that's being used direct and 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 if in a very specific context and then they just pull it out and then they throw it at everything that they dislike and that they think it applies to. All right. You know, cuz 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 Yeshua said that you know, <laughs> You know, usurp the law with your own traditions, or however he phrased it, right? Uh, again, if, if we if, if we go back to the actual discussion uh, about this, he's not talking to Pharisees, uh, or he's not talking about the Pharisees. He's talking about the ruling of the sages, and in 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 favor, he he submits a ruling from the Pharisees, um, but. He tried. He essentially tried to reduce your point down to, well, yeah. I mean, they make it back then, and they make it today. That's just evidence that they did ritual bathings. It's like, no, that's <laughs> not what he said. He said the way they built their mikvahs is in accordance with what we know the oral law says to build them like. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's it's not saying that. Oh, well, yeah, we live in houses today, and they lived in houses back then. No, it's saying, no, the way that houses are built today are the same as they were back then. That, that would be an actual equivalent, right? It, like, right. <laughs> and I, I, what I find interesting about that is because it there's two things in what he said that prove that he wasn't actually listening and was just waiting for his, his chance to talk. That's one of them. The fact that he didn't even represent your argument correctly, um, it, which which tells me he wasn't actually listening. He heard the word mikvah and assumed where you were going to go with it and checked out. He didn't hear any of the rest. Um, but it's the fact that he admitted before he said anything. I I, um, I don't even remember what the question was. <laughs> right. That was three minutes ago. Not even. A minute and a half, maybe. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. I mean, he's just sitting there. Gra grasping at things because like I, I think the structure of the mikvah is incredibly important i mean there's plenty of people out there i know who in in the larger world that i i'm around in who think you can just you know dig a hole and there you go you got a mikvah like it's just there there i mean there's all kinds of things along those lines i mean i'm sure that they would have um evidences probably of mezuzahs as well uh from that time i i just couldn't cite any archaeological evidence of that but i am sure that somehow somewhere they do exist in that way um right. is just i did that was the one that i had and it was about the building right and he just went well mikvahs i mean it, it just seems like a very strange argument okay so they had mikvahs built that way back then that means they did ritual washing then they did ritual washing now i mean you could make that argument about anything I mean, it's sort of like the sky was blue. The sky is blue now. The sky was blue then. Like, okay. Right. It, it's interestingly enough, you know, because when we talk about people who, who think that, you know, oh, you just dig a hole in the ground and there's water there and, you know, you call it good. Thumbs up, right? Um, that actually still exists uh, in... I would I would say probably the worst form that I think I've ever seen it, which is those who try to perform their own their own sacrifices in their own backyards. 
that's a, that's that's a real thing yep right um it is a fringe let's let's you know let's not make it out to be a bigger thing than it is it is an extreme fringe minority but it does exist and none of these people have some of them don't even have altars built uh, but some of them, some of them do have altars built, and the ones that do, none of them look the same, um, because you know, like what? So, what is the altar supposed to look like? You know, you can read the written Torah, and uh, if you apply even as rigidly as possible the description given, um, you can come up with a few different variations of what it's going to look like. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, what? Who, which one is right, right? If, if we have four people who build four altars and they all look different, but they all technically meet the standards that are written in the written Torah, you know, who's right? Which one is the picture that Moses was shown by Hashem? Yeah. You know, uh, things like this obviously necessitate that there's more detail given other than what is written, right? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, especially when it comes to something that you know, Moshe was shown a picture, right? He was shown an image of these things. Okay, cool. We did not get a description that is uh, in-depth enough to replicate what Moshe was shown in an image. Okay, we right. don't... The only place that we have those kind of details where we could replicate, uh, that would be in the Oral Torah. Yeah, and, and, and this argument as well the sort of discussion that we're sort of going off on a tangent on but i think it's a worthy discussion to have goes to this place of of the sitsis on the belt loops and all that kind of stuff that also happens one of the things is it shows a disrespect even for scripture itself um uh the the disrespect for scripture itself i mean it it fundamentally says well, you know, it doesn't really matter how we make it. As long as we make it and you, we have the spirit that tells us, you know, uh, how it, to do this, it just shows disrespect for the written Torah itself. And and because you don't care how it's actually made, how it's actually supposed to be made, how God instructed it to be made in the scripture itself. So th there's this, this argument that's made, and I'm getting a little bit on my soapbox here, but this go argument off. made that you go, you sit there and you, 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 you can stand and yell at me about we have the Holy Spirit and we're going to make our belt loops and all that kind of stuff. Well, no, God has a specific way of making God. He has a specific way that he intended it to be done. And if you're going to do it just in the 5,000 different ways that are done in, in sort of, I guess, our movement, we would call it, uh, in the Messianic movement, it, it just shows a complete disrespect for Scripture itself. Yep. Yep. And that's interesting. It, that, that reminds me also of like the sacred name, you know, movement where it's, it's like, you know, it, it doesn't matter which way you choose to say it. It just matters that you're saying it right. like that's like extraordinarily disrespectful to the name of Hashem. Right? Yeah. I was in one of those Facebook posts and, and something was going on and I was like, well, because I take it so seriously, don't take the name of the Lord in vain that I don't even actually say it, right? It's like, it's this idea. And they, they sort of laughed at me because they were like, well, you're supposed to say it, say the name. You don't take, you want to take it in vain. And if you say whatever, every, anything else people are saying, then you're taking it in vain. And it's just like, no, it, it's that important. <laughs> right. And if, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're so 100% sure that the way that you're pronouncing it is the right way, because the spirit told you, but like five other people who pronounce it five other different ways, all all attest that the spirit told them that was the way. And that's my problem with the Holy Spirit argument, right? The the Holy Spirit is so often used as the get out of jail free card. The I don't actually have to present an argument for what I'm doing or for my position, right? I don't actually have to defend my premise. The Holy Spirit told me, right? It's it's invoking divine authority uh, to protect your opinion. Well, yeah, and if you think about it, it goes to the root of what the founder of the Satanic Church says, right? The Holy Spirit 
is used to simply worship self often. I'm not saying all the time, but I'm saying very often when somebody says the Holy Spirit gave me this or the Holy Spirit gave me that, fundamentally it's worshiping your own idea. And it um, it's such I, I don't I don't know why anybody would actually consciously use that as an argument also because it's such an easy one to throw back, right? Well, the Holy Spirit told me that, you know, this is the way it's pronounced and I can I can just as easily turn around and say, well, the Holy Spirit told me to tell you to stop. <laughs> right. You know, so what are you going to do then? You 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 going to disobey the spirit? <laughs> <laughs> right. It's yeah. Uh, but we we got a little off topic there. Let's uh, <laughs> yeah, let's get back on topic. Yeah. Let's, let's bring things back. Uh, let's see. Right. Up, so can I answer that? Can I can I respond to that a little bit? Because I just feel like that was a little bit of a of a sort of a. Can you do it in thirty seconds? Important to this topic. Yeah, I, I'll try to do it in thirty seconds. Um, mm -hmm. The the. The issue is, is that I can trust the Jews that the reports of what the Tanim said, that they're not going to make up the law, that what the Tanim said at the time of the Jews. And so they record it as discussions at the time of the Jews. I trust that they would record them accurately for the sake of their own religion, as well as, as for the sake of, of, of Judaism and continuing the process and wanting to hold the truth. All right. So, so I trust that they, they were accurate in their description of the Tanim. All right. So, um, Got a question for Rabbi Eduardo uh, from Ken from Ken Ames, I believe. I'm sorry if I mispronounced that, but he says, "If you believe that Yeshua is the Son of God and taught with the authority of God, then why do you directly disobey Him by allowing yourself to hold the title of Rabbi?" I don't believe the Bible is the Word of God. No, I'm just kidding. So the the, re the reason why I allow myself to be called rabbi is because the first time, and I'm glad this came up in written documentation that any person is called rabbi, it was John the Immerser. And you know what Yeshua said about John, who allowed himself to be called rabbi, in case Ken Ames doesn't read the Bible. Um, it says that um those are born among women, no one's greater than John the Immerser, and he allowed himself to be called rabbi. So Yeshua must not have been making a blanket ruling that you can't be called a rabbi. If you continue to read the passage in context, which is what I would recommend for Ken Ames, read the Bible in context, read that passage in context. It was about hypocrisy, about making broad to fill in and making your seats long your phylacteries this was the passage it wasn't about the usage of the title rabbi it was about hypocrisy which is very much related to matthew 23. all right uh david Castell, did you oh i think he's gonna let you respond do you have anything you wanted to say to that or no i mean that sounded to... like a pretty good uh pretty good argument thanks man i got it i got it from you no, hey. <laughs> all right so I, I just I, I have to I have to touch on that because it's very convenient, right? It's it's very convenient when we can you know venture outside of the the strict written word um, and uh, assume other things onto the text uh, in in this particular instance because you know it allows us to to have this title of clout when you know the written word that that uh, we know that Yeshua said um, actually would would directly contradict that if we limit it to that written word. Now I'm not I'm not saying that I just disagree with his synopsis um, and I think <laughs> I think that probably there's a better argument even to be made there in favor of what he's arguing. I'm just I'm just saying it's awful convenient that he takes that position on this issue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. And so I, the I, next, I the next question. One. Say what? I, I had a little laugh in the debate, if you notice. Right, right, right. <laughs> the next question we have from Aspects of Ashley. Um, if the contents of the oral law is so important to understanding... Why wasn't it written down to avoid these type of disputes? To be free and flexible and creative was really essential to what I wanted to make. And I didn't find a platform. That... I don't know. Okay. I'm assuming that's the me. Yes. Yeah. 
Um, <clears throat> it was actually forbidden to be written down. Uh, the reason that it was forbidden to be written down is because we want to continue with a continuity of the people. So the, the if you have a book, it's very easy for you to lose a teacher. And it's incredibly important for you to have a teacher. And it's incredibly important for you to have someone to pass it down to you, to not do something on your own. I'm, I'm accused of this all the time uh, because I, I have some views that don't quite fit in with Jews and quite, don't quite fit in with Christians. Um, but for me, you know, I have a rabbi that I go to and I respect and, and um, who answers a lot of questions for me. And so um, the not wanting to get away from a teacher is an incredibly bad idea because you get a lot from not just reading a book of what somebody said, but also following them around and seeing if their actions match up with what they wrote. And so the reason that you don't have the oral law written down is to encourage the continuation of going to a rabbi and appearing before a rabbi and attaching yourself to a rabbi and really living life as you were supposed to. So a disciple in that day would, the hair would be the same. The, the beard would be the same. The sitsis would be the same. Like you, you followed your rabbi and everything that he did. Um, there's a, there's a, a thing in the Talmud, which is a, a written version of this is a, a Talmud literally followed people into the, of uh, uh, Rabbi um, Khania, followed him into the bathroom, followed him underneath his bed to sort of, see what the rabbi did, how the rabbi lived. And I think that's really important for us as followers of Yeshua. Um, we should hey, see- I think I remember that. I'm sorry, but what was what was he going to watch the rabbi do to learn from him? Um, go to the bath. There's bathroom. There's one that's about bathroom. There's one about intimacy with the wife, which goes to the whole talking to I mean, women. He was going to watch his rabbi have sex with his wife? No, he was going to listen to hear the conversation. He's going to listen to his, his yeah. rabbi have sex with his wife to learn how to be like him? The conversation, yeah. So th that's this part is, of the oral Torah. This is part of the Talmud, yeah. So the, yeah, the oral Torah, yeah. The okay. idea is is that it, um, it is a devotion to the rabbi. Um, I don't think what you're probably going to say is isn't that kind of immoral and gross. Um, but the issue, it's more to teach the lesson of to be committed to your rabbi and to follow your rabbi. Um, in, Does that make sense to you? Does that make sense to you, David? To follow your rabbi in all aspects. No, of no. Do you? Do, if you had a student, you would want him laying under your bed while you uh, make love to your honey bunny. No, I. Um, that's my wife, not my honey bunny. But yeah, uh, uh, my wife is my honey bunny, so I don't know. <laughs> I spice it up, brother. Uh, Look, what I'm saying is, would you want your student to sneak under your bed to listen to you, um, be intimate with your wife? I so, would want. I wouldn't want my actions. I'm going to say it this way because I know what I know what you're trying to get into. I would want asking. my actions to match up with what I teach. And so if my actions don't match up with what I teach, then I would want to have someone follow me. I do have people following me around, but I would want people to follow me around to see how I behave, which is what the disciples did with Yeshua. They followed him everywhere. Um, so if you're this, I just have a question real quick. So if your student, uh, I'm sure you have students said, look, Rabbi David, I believe the Jewish people have the oracles of God, that we have a Torah, we have an oral tradition. And here was a positive thing to sneak under the bed of my rabbi and listen to his wife. This is what I would want to do. What would you tell him? It, it is what I would not recommend. Would you tell him to do the oral Torah or not do it? I would tell him to do the oral Torah. And we have so you would tell him to go under your bed and listen to you be intimate with your wife? No, we have halakas for that now. So you yeah, would tell him to not do that? To I not follow the oral law. Follow, I would not tell him to follow me. I would give him the, bo the book. So you would tell him not to listen to you against the I oral Torah? Would you tell him to listen to the oral Torah? I don't know. I would tell would... him to listen to the oral Torah. And I give so him you would tell him to go into the bed and listen to you? No. Again, there are varying understand. There are varying understand. Which is why it's not the word of God. Opinion. There are many opinions. Elo ve elo. This, the halakhic positions... I'm not saying it's a word of God. Rabbinic Judaism itself says. Stop it here or wait till this painful moment is done. But, well, yeah, we, 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 can, we can stop it there. It, it Tell us, tell share with us the, the confusion that Rabbi Eduardo is trying to uh, sow here. Because... I, I, the, the first problem is is when you said okay this is a story in the Talmud and he and he and he went oh the oral law and I'm like well, okay no the Talmud is not the oral law <laughs> right but so so yeah it, it, explain it's, explain better that situation right so like 
I was doing it and I thought I had made it pretty clear about the idea of following your Rebbe, of being like your Rebbe, which is what I teach, right? And so one of the big things is very important to me is, is that Yeshua taught oral law. And so therefore I learn oral law. Um, we're actually looking to put together a few projects of talking about how he holds for Pesach or how he holds for this or different kinds of things and getting understanding a halakha. In Hasidus, you attach yourself to your Rebbe so, so strongly that you want to be like a spitting image of the Rebbe. And I explained that in the argument. What Rabbi Eduardo jumped on is that I used a very explicit and very somewhat um, taken out of context. Lude. <laughs> huh? It, lewd even, lewd. You, you could say, yeah. yeah. But I, wa I wanted to show about the importance of attaching yourself to the rabbi, and that is why you have the oral laws, because it is one thing to read the Talmud, and it's another thing to understand it from the words of your rabbi. Whatever rabbi you listen to, whatever rabbi you go to, one of the difficulties with me being outside of a congregation now is I don't have a rabbi to sort of ask some of these questions to, some questions that I might have that I can't figure out myself to learn from. Right? I mean, I, I can learn... Um, you know, OUTorah.org and stuff like that, I can learn so much, but there's a different thing about seeing your rabbi eye to eye, going there, being a part of the congregation all the time, being able to see the things that aren't said, um, the sort of speaking between the lines, the, 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 not only the mode of what he preaches, but how he preaches it. And that was what I was trying to get at. I, and, and he's jumping on it to distract away from the aspect of um, you know, do we want to be like Yeshua or not, our rabbi, right? And and keeping the oral law and and doing things um, in the way that the rabbis would say, and and trying to make a connection between the difference of what he does, which is read the Talmud, and then pulls these things out that he can jump on. Which I fell into that trap and pull something he can jump on, but understanding it in context is just talking about the rabbi disciple relationship which is something that i don't think exists in christianity messianic judaism but it definitely exists in hasidic in, in hasidic judaism especially um and right. i was trying to get the difference between those two things uh, an example of hmm i i think that what he was doing was a little bit uh, disingenuous. And um, here's, here's an example of why. Okay. This is a story about uh, a disciple that is illustrating his level of devotion to his rabbi. Right. And so he's using the story and asking you, okay, if you had a disciple, which one would you tell him to do this? Would you tell him not to do this? Look, Let's just pull another example right out of the text here, right? Um, in John chapter 13, uh, 20, verse 23 uh, says that the, the disciple that Jesus loved was uh, lying or leaning on his bosom. Uh, matter of fact, even later, verse 25, it says, then lying on Jesus' breast, uh, say unto the Lord, who is it? Okay, this is, this is their, their uh, asking about who is going to betray Yeshua at this point. And uh, it, it clearly says, it says the disciple whom Jesus loved. Okay, so we, we all understand John is talking about John. Um, and it says that he was, he was lying on his chest, right? It, it makes it sound a little bit, a little bit oddly intimate between men. Uh, so, you know, Rabbi Eduardo, uh, if, if one of your disciples decided he just wanted to casually, you know, lay on your chest, is it, would, so would you tell him to do what Jesus, what, what, what Jesus's disciples did, or would you, would you, would you not, <laughs> right. right? Which, which one of these is appropriate, yeah. right? Or maybe, maybe John is telling us a story to indicate kind of, you know, how, how much, uh, love the, the disciple had for Yeshua and Yeshua had for his disciples, um, it's, it's, it's very likely the case. Um, there, there's actually, there's numerous scholars who would say that probably some of what John writes is not necessarily a word for word of what, of what Yeshua said, or even, even what exactly happened, but more 
how John saw it, right? Yeah. Or even like an Agad, I, I, I'm going to go out on a limb and, and say this, but I think a lot of it is actually Agadic and just sort of the the actual details of the story not as important and maybe didn't did or did not happen. I'm willing to leave that open as for whether or not it even actually happened, but it might just be a story being told in which to, especially in the book of John to get across um, something in a way, uh, an agotic story is told whether or not some of these agotic stories actually happened. Um, I don't think it's really important. I think what John is getting at is, the relationship and teaching how to behave. And I mean, the woman at the well is one of the ones that I think, did it happen? Did it not happen? I don't think it really matters. I think the the message behind it matters a lot more. So right, it, it's, it's those kinds of things that I think are really, really important. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, he want to do it with, uh, with John. And I, unfortunately that didn't come to mind in the midst of this debate. <laughs> but that would have been a great one to pull up. Um, hopefully I remembered if I get into another debate next time. <laughs> yep. That's, uh, you know, that is, that's how my mind thinks about things anymore. It's you, you debate enough people and eventually you're, you're kind of these, these conversations are always lingering at the back of your mind. And so you hear this neat little factoid and, and your brain instantly goes, Oh, that would be really good for this one. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, Rob bomb says it's the word of God, though. The Risa and the Rabbanon. The mm -hmm. the the what you follow with the rabbis is clearly different from what is written to Rita. There is a distinction that is made. The Rita is from the Torah, written Torah itself. The Rabbanon is from the rabbis. So you don't want him to follow there the oral is Torah. A, there is a def definitive difference between oral Torah and written Torah in mm -hmm. oral Torah itself. Was so according to Rambam, you said Rambam can establish halakhic belief that he obligates you legally to believe something, he can do that. He says that the Gemara was given to Mount Sinai. You said in Talmud, it's a positive thing to listen to your rabbi, be intimate with his wife, and now you're going to tell them not to do that. My friend, do you not see how inconsistent your worldview is that it crumbles before you? It does not crumble before me. You're misunderstanding. And I got a one if his world you're, crumbles, you're crumbles before him in the comment section. Hopefully we get somebody who's an Orthodox Jew. So for, for everyone watching, what he did there, again, and I'm going to use this example again. I've used this in one of the previous parts. What he did there is literally the equivalent of, of, of going, hey, Yeshua said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. So he called Peter Satan. And we know from you know Ezekiel and Isaiah that, Satan was the serpent that was in the Garden of Eden, a.k.a. Peter was in the Garden of Eden. Right. It's like, okay, well, hold on. Hold on there. Right. <laughs> we, we're, we've we we've got one that's 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 uh, an, an allegoric <coughs> statement from Yeshua. Right. Get thee behind me, Satan. He's not literally calling Peter Satan. Right. Uh, we've got another instance here that is prophecy that's not actually referring to Satan because Satan's never mentioned in any of those passages. Um, and then we have the serpent in the Garden of Eden that's never identified as Satan. So, like, we have three different types of writings here and three different styles of narrative and trying to interweave them all to make it an, an immutable fact that Peter was in the Garden of Eden. That, that we're, that's improper application of each of these three individual instances and styles of writing. That's essentially what he's doing here, with, but with the Talmud. Yeah, and he's also crazy on this Rambam thing and doesn't understand how that works. But we we beat that probably like a dead horse uh, too much uh, in the previous session. So, yeah, I mean, it's nothing that we haven't covered already. Right. You can ask a good question, Rabbi. Before I started using HoneyBook, we hit $80,000 in revenue. Uh, Eduardo, about the how how the halakhic process works. Now I'm right? not Rabbi Eduardo. You see that? <laughs> there's Shulchan Aruch. There's there's Shulchan Aruch. There's Mishnah Berurah. There's other halakh words. Monte Ephraim. There's different halakhas for different communities. Are they Those, more authoritative than Rambam? Huh? Are they more authoritative than Rambam? 
they're for different communities. Almost nobody follows the Rambam. It does not, uh, let me ask you a question. Does rabbinic Judaism... The community that follows the Rambam, the Mishnah Torah, from beginning to end right now, mm -hmm. is a Yemeni community, and they're, okay. they're quite small. Most okay. Ashkenazic Jews follow Mishra Rua. Um, Hungarian Jews follow Monte Ephraim, which is cool. sort of... Can I ask you a question Mishra. really quick? What? Does the does the oral Torah state that there no one has a, there's never been a prophet in Israel like Moses until Moses referring to Rambam? Uh, I'm not sure if he says that or not. Not him. Has it been said of him? Possibly. I'm not. Uh, but I don't know for 100. percent So is there anyone greater in Orthodox Judaism than Rambam after the time of the uh, Nevi'im? Depends on who you talk to. It is not monolithic. There is well, before you, my brother, crumbles. It's not crumbles monolithic. It is multiple. There are multiple halakhic distinctions. It is not you begin and end with the Rambam. There are other halakhic authorities. Yosef Ka Rabbi Yosef Karo, um, who wrote the Shulchan Aruch, is another one. It is incredibly unpopular and important with the Sephardic community. Crumbles, my brother. You crumbles, can have a Yeshua follower that follows according to Yeshua. I've actually change some of my you menhoff. can have a yeshua follow who follows according to yeshua can we yes. run that thing back okay. uh, so there can be a yeshua follower that doesn't follow yeshua yeah crumbles my brother crumbles you man Repent, have brother. come into the truth oh, brother oh, come oh, into yeah. the yeah, truth you can absolutely <laughs> you can absolutely have a yeshua follower who doesn't follow yeshua i would dare say that the majority of the evangelical christian church at large right these are all how followers we, of Jesus who don't really live by how we uh, <laughs> Who could possibly even fall let under say, the Okay, let me, let, me, let me amend. Uh, they don't live by his teachings as per the written word of what he said, right? They, they right. have some other ethereal, um, you know, uh, more abstract interpretation of what he said that makes it more relevant uh, to them without having to put the effort into obeying Torah. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I mean, I mean, it's just all over the place. I mean, you have it. Yeah. Anyway, I mean, then, and the nice sure follow follow say, you know, the Catholics that did the pogroms and the, uh, all those things, they're not real believers. Okay. Okay. Sure. Yep. <laughs> Or who does not follow Yeshua? That is true. All right, I have a you question. Have... There's another question here. That's uh, there's another question here by Henry. Um, how do you guys reconcile John eight fifty eight? Henry, the... oh, okay, John eight fifty eight. What's the yeah. uh, before Abraham was? I am. How do you? How do you? Because you you uh, you don't affirm the deity of Christ, do you? Uh, we said we were going to talk about this. I right, can, I just, can, can I just? Can I just? Can I? It never fails. It never fails. It doesn't matter what topic you are talking about. It doesn't matter if it's, <laughs> if, it's, if it's kosher law, if it's if it's Shabbat, it, it, if, if it's it does not matter what topic you are talking about. You start spitting some Jewish knowledge at people, throwing some Talmudic quotes that give some historical context to the conversation of the New Testament, and it's starting to cause somebody to ask questions, right? It's, it's, it's not jiving with whatever they've been taught, and they're suddenly very unsure of everything they've ever learned in their lives, and boom! Out comes the Trinity card. Do you affirm the Trinity, right? Because if you say no, I get to dismiss everything that you've just said. And that's essentially how it's treated. Yep. And I gave a sort of answer that didn't come out and say it as explicitly because I was just dealing with getting disowned by my in-laws and my wife was getting disowned by my in-laws and we said we weren't going to talk about that topic mm. now it's whatever so <laughs> um it's pretty well known that i am i want to even say unitarian because that also tends towards a modalism which i don't hold to strict either strict monotheist is probably my favorite way yeah. of wording that yeah yep strict monotheist yep yeah let's uh 
it's, it's it, I'm glad I'm glad that you said that too, and you were like, I was told I wouldn't have to talk about this <laughs> because <laughs> it actually it kind of shows a little bit of the intellectual dishonesty of what's happening behind the scenes here with this debate, right? right. It, it kind of shows that they 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 didn't really make good on the word that they were that they were promising. Yeah. Oh, we did say we said we're going to stick to the debate, but yeah, you not want to deal with that. If you, you don't I'll answer to, it. I'll it answer. Yeah, you see. Okay, you see the way. You asked, oh, you don't want to deal with that. All right. So this is a challenge now. It's 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 a. Uh, oh, oh, you you're gonna wuss out on me. Right. What a. Oh. <laughs> it is a little off. So you don't. I'll have answer to. it. I just thought it was interesting. I'll answer it. Eight. Matthew eight thirty eight. You said. John, John 858. 858. John Jesus, 8. Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was born, I am. Oh, okay. I can answer that question. That doesn't have, yeah. I can answer that question. All right. Go ahead. Okay. But Rabbi, Rabbi Eduardo said he wanted to talk about it first. As succinctly as possible, guys, because this one is a little off the, the subject. So I do, I did want to. Get a brief answer from you. So as Colossians says, and as other passages of the New Testament says, he's the visible image of the invisible God. He makes God known. He makes the Father known. God is complex in his unity. When you see the Son, you see the Father because they are one being but multiple persons. He is eternal, um, not created, um, forever existed, Son of God who took on flesh at one point and gave himself on behalf of humanity, died, stood on the ground for three days, rose again, victorious, sits at the right hand of the Father, the Ego Ami, is the Greek form of Ahiyashia Ahie. He is God Himself. Anything else is heretical. David, please share your position. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I mean, he literally um, just so quotes the uh, going, I am not just, a replacement theologian, hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, and I will... go ahead. He just literally quotes the Athanasian Creed, which I give him credit. Most Trinitarians don't actually know what the Trinity doctrine is, but right. he just literally adds a bunch of things in which are from the Athanasian Creed, which are not actually in scripture are not found in scripture so give him credit for being honest and knowing what the trinity doctrine actually is right <laughs> you know and you you know what 100 percent correct because most really don't they most have never read the athanasian creed right right um which is actually it, it's one of my favorite things to tell people like whenever the topic comes up it's like okay look go read the athanasian creed then come back to me we can talk about this if you can make sense of it right because i mean Try and make sense of the Athanasian Creed, um, <laughs> but I, it, it it's fascinating that he quoted the Athanasian Creed, basically more or less. He paraphrased the Athanasian Creed, um, because that's not written in the Bible, right? Right? It's not. It's not written in the. It's not in the written words. So, I mean, where where's it cut? Where's it come from? Is that what tradition does that come from? What's uh, you, like, you see what I mean? Like <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> crumbles before you brother. Crumbles before you. <laughs> okay. I will not quote uh, those who propose replacement theology. Uh, my answer to 858 is it is Jewish tradition that the soul of Messiah was uh, uh, born and create it before the foundation of the world, before the sun. So how do you recognize that? Well, I uh, obviously precedes the creation of the world. So how, how do you reconcile John 858? Because the soul of Messiah was, was created before the foundation of the world. The soul of Messiah, which, what is that? Which is before Abraham. The soul, the soul of the Messiah. Oh, the so this, soul this of is the a Messiah. midrash that the soul of the Messiah, the name of Messiah, existed before the world created. So this is the idea that the messiah was created at some point which is not a proper belief or perspective which i would love to debate david another time on oh, um, according to the new testament all right so you gonna take him up on that debate i don't know you don't know <laughs> you've been aiming be, for I it for tell you what i'd love to moderate that one if it happens <laughs> sounds good so the soul of the messiah existed before Abraham was born, created before created. Abraham was born, created before the before the world was born. Okay, don't hop in, Avery. Don't hop in. Avery. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, last question. 
from John Scott, because I don't see any other questions here. Um, but uh, just wanted to put this coming up here because this made me laugh when he was talking about <laughs> the, the rabbi thing. Uh, he says, how is this different from filthy Quran? <laughs> I, I, can I answer that? Can I answer that, though? Because I think there's I think there's something that people have to understand, which is really important, that God has chosen the Jewish people in many ways and that even though the jewish people are cut off from the messiah and they remain by the wayside they can still be grafted back on i do believe that god has left crumbs of truth within the traditions of the house of israel that point to the messiah out of love for the fathers abraham isaac and jacob that he wants the jewish people to come back to him so i believe that there have been seeds of truth left in there so in many ways it is different from Whoa. quran and the hadith in the sense that as a people what's that i mean that I'm hearing it again, but so anti-Semitic. The Jewish people are cut off from God. It, that what? Right. Yep. And that's. I, I mean, I just let it sink in that that's that that's probably a majority belief. Right, yeah. just across across all of evangelicism, uh, across obviously Catholicism, Orthodox Christianity, um, and uh, and of course naturally uh, most of the Messianic movement at large and uh, the Hebrew Roots movement. You know, um, it, it it's it's not like full blown supersessionism. Um, there there are lots of people probably who believe that God is not finished with the Jewish people, right? And then there's they probably maybe believe in some kind of ultimate redemption where, you know, suddenly the eyes of all Jews will be opened and they'll realize that, you know, Jesus is God and uh, that that Torah is invalid. And, you know, they'll finally wake up and get and, and they'll get the deal. And, uh, you know, then that's that's when everything will be hunky dory. Um, but that's yeah. I mean, that. Just I mean, it just I've heard it before, but it's just it's just. It just struck me as like the most anti-Semitic thing I've heard in a long time. Um, I, I don't know why it shocked me just now, but but yeah, I mean, it is a common belief, like you said. Um, I just didn't didn't realize how blunt about it he actually was. It it's fascinating to me because I would imagine that he's probably in contact with multiple multiple Orthodox Jews you know, religious Orthodox Jews who live a, re a religious or Orthodox life. Maybe he's not. I don't know. Um, I just don't. I don't understand the level of cognitive dissonance that has to be in effect for you to shake hands regularly with a faithful Orthodox Jew who maybe disagrees with you about the person of Messiah Um they probably could find a, a fair level of agreement about the times of Messiah. Um, and I, I don't know how you could know such a wonderful person who exhibits nothing but the love of Hashem uh, and devotion to Hashem and say that they are severed and cut off from God. I, I, there's no words right I, I i really it's it's a level of cognitive dissonance that i can't fathom you know it, it it's at a certain point where just in my own personal life and my own interactions with uh, certain of the orthodox jews that i've i've had the privilege of being in contact with um and uh some of some of the times that they've they've been there for me when I really needed somebody to be there for me. Um, not just, you know, not just in person or, or even in a phone call, but just prayer wise uh, and, you know, uh, appealing to, to Hashem on my behalf. Um, you know, it just, it, it, there was a time where I was, I was explaining a story to my dad about one of these instances. And I, I just said, dad, we don't deserve these people, you know, and I see the love of Hashem in them. Uh, and I, I can't go back, right. There's no way to unsee that. 
So I don't know like what it would take for a, a a human being who has experienced that to then say, yeah, these people are cut off from God. Yeah. It's more pronounced in the Messianic Jewish expression of it because so much of the talk is about the Jewish people. And then these things come out. It, it's, it's, it's more pronounced. I feel like in the church. Okay. They're doing their own thing. They're completely separated from anything Jewish. You can sort of go the whole Tanochid uh, Nishba, like the 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 captured, um, you know, the kidnapped child or whatever, um, with the church. You can sort of explain a little bit, but in, in Messianic Judaism, that has at least somewhat of a connection to at least some aspect of the Jewish people. It just makes it much more pronounced. Yeah. Let's see. I know he wasn't done there. Uh oh. Okay, there we go. Well, the Muslims don't are not in covenant with the God of Israel, right? As individuals, they come into covenant with the God of Israel. But the Jewish people remain total in a covenant with the God of Israel, but they are cut off from the tree. And the root of the tree is the Abrahamic covenant, so they don't get that nourishment. But it's very important that we understand, even as you may be from the nations, you may be part of a church, understand that you don't boast against the natural branches because the natural branches can be grafted back on and you can be taken off for your boasting. So there's something to understand there that's different because the covenants were given to the Father. So just try to try to try to get that. But it is it is true that there are many things that have been added because of the flesh of men. So I, I, I just got to say there, right, he he's quoting Romans 11, right. obviously quoting Romans 11, right? You have the natural natural branches cut off and then wild branches grafted in and then, you know, the natural branches can be uh, grafted back, back in. But I, this passage is so often misquoted and the way that it's misquoted is by uh by presenting that the natural branches were all cut off wholesale, every single one of them cut off. That, that is not what the passage says. It says some of the natural branches were cut off. Yep. Okay. So what does that mean? A lot of people would say, well, yeah, the, the, the natural branches that weren't cut off, those were the Jews who believed in Jesus. I, that that's an entire subject that I could go on a soapbox on for hours. We don't have time to get into that now. Right. Jameis and I have addressed that, and we've addressed the totality of Romans 11 in another video, I think like two years ago or something like that. Go look for that video. Um, uh, I think maybe we address it in the Better Call Paul series. Either way. <laughs> <laughs> um, or no, no, no. It's one of the, it's uh, one of the, what does it mean uh, to be grafted in? I think that's what, that that's what the video is called. Um I just yeah, I, I just had to had to address that. It's so awkward. Like, yeah. passage and, was that? It's just a completely misunderstanding that whole that whole passage in Romans nine to eleven. Right, right. And I'm glad you said nine to eleven because yeah, that's that's really kind of where it begins. Right. But yeah. So the fun thing with the serpent is, how does a serpent talk? What, what, and not only that, but why is the serpent's punishment to crawl on its belly when... Those are both good questions. All right. Um, that's that's it for our our questions. It looks like no one else has had any questions. And we're at an hour and 30-something minutes. So I think this is this was pretty good. I, this was really fulfilling. So I okay. wanted to thank Radar Apologetics and David Costello for coming on to the... Okay. So we're done. It's done. <laughs> Five parts. There we go. All right. We finally, yeah, we, we, we finally finished that. Uh, this has been an absolute pleasure the entire time, actually. It's been, yeah. it's, it's been really awesome to go over this with you. Um, and, 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 and finally kind of let you speak without being interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, clarify and also bring up some really important topics and, and, that is something that I think these topics need to keep being talked about. And, and it's been a pleasure going over it with you. I mean, this debate is how I found each other. So I am, I am really happy for that. Um, Absolutely. Uh, because it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you and the other members of alternate media. So um, just, we really do align on a lot of places. So I, it's really quite amazing that we, we were able to do that. So I'm thankful for the debate in that sense. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, it was just, it was a very difficult to debate and I'm, I'm thankful to be able to bring up these topics um, in a longer form. So thank you for providing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, hope, hopefully we'll be able to do, you know, a lot more stuff like this. There's probably a couple of other debates I'd, 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 I'd probably love to have you review with me on just you know, maybe about something else entirely, just because honestly, I love hearing your thoughts and not just here. Uh, like D David and I have had other discussions in, in other platforms. Um, yep. And, uh, and, and just the, yeah, I, I love bouncing things off of you and hearing your thoughts. They're always spectacular and fascinating. Um, so I definitely, I'll, I'll find another debate at some point for us yeah. to, to review. <laughs> yeah. Let me know. I, I, I love doing this because, um, love taking the just discussions and arguing sort of from different places and, and different places and different arguments and things like that. And so it was in a Bible study we were, we were talking about, um, the difference of the Korban, uh, of a Korbanoach between the Rambam and the Ramban. I was like, you know, I always take Rambam side. Let me take Rambam side this time. <laughs> And so just the fun of being able to argue for the Rambam against the Ramban when I, I hold to the Ramban, I hold to Ramban's view of it, but it's always fun to do it. And maybe we can do some of that as well. Um, Absolutely. Going through the debate and really just sort of looking at it from different perspectives as well. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, um, that's another thing I want to start hosting more debates too. So like, uh, again, yeah, if, if, if that's a debate that you're, you're willing to entertain naturally, the, the Trinity debate is a very popular one on our platform. Right. Obviously, um, <laughs> eventually, um, yeah, eventually we, we got to get around to having another debate on that. Um, but I, we, we did so many in a row that I was just like, all right, we've got to like take a break or like have a debate about some other topic. That's not the Trinity. Right. right. <laughs> um, so yeah, at some point we'll, we'll get back in the swing of having those debates again. I, I would love to moderate it. I'm sure Seamus would love to moderate it, or maybe yeah. we can do like a, we, we can do a team Z you and me together against uh, another, another team, another duo on, on something. Yeah. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Absolutely. But I'm, I'm glad we were able to make it through this. Uh, I definitely hope that this series has uh, enlightened some, on the on the truth of the oral Torah, where it's found in the text of Scripture, why the arguments for it are valid, why the arguments against it are weak. I'm, I'm not going to try and be nice there. <laughs> um, and uh, I, I again, if you want to see more content like this, uh, hit the like and subscribe button, ring that bell. Definitely go check out David's channel, Ahavas Chinam, um, and uh, they've got excellent content there uh, a lot of it good good explanatory content um and i think you guys also uh have like a, a an area for people to meet and interact with one another who are single right yes we do uh yeah that's something we actually just started we uh we have a whatsapp group for singles right now there is one lady in there and a whole bunch of uh, of guys so we're looking for single ladies who are in this sort of niche um, right. in this Torah observance, um, strictly monotheistic. Um, uh, if you're not strictly monotheistic, there, there are some who are not strictly monotheistic, but in this sort of niche of, of this world, uh, we would love to have you over there at that as well. So, um, you can sign up. Um, I don't know all the details. My wife sort of sets up the WhatsApp group and how you can get in contact with us. We get in contact with us and my wife will let you know how you can join that singles group. And um, yeah, I put out us a, a little thing each day um, from a Bashert game, which is put out by Modern Orthodox to sort of help people find uh, matches. So that's uh, that's something that we're trying to do. And that's, uh, there's a lot of conversations going on in there. So um, yep. we just need it, more ladies. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I, and, and I was, I was glad to hear about that. Cause uh, you know, for those of you who may think that that sounds, you know, maybe, maybe a little odd or funny, like it's already odd enough to be Torah pursuant, right. As a follower of Yeshua. So like your, 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 uh, pool of dating is already very, very limited because this is already going to be an argument with pretty much anybody that you meet at any church somewhere, you know, maybe you'll be fortunate enough to find somebody who will listen and hear you out. So, 
you know, uh, to to have an avenue and a place to meet people who are kind of they're already of the are already of this mind, you know, that to, to for somebody to facilitate that is a great thing. Um, so, yes, if that's uh, if you're if you're a uh, single and tour pursuant, then um, yeah, and, and, and strictly monotheist. <laughs> strictly monotheistic. Um, do info at uh, a and um, my wife, who's usually the one who helps people get into that group, will let you know what needs to be done in order for you to be a part of that. And so, um, we're also trying to raise money so we can do this more often. So, um, if you want to like and subscribe to our page, that would be great too. Um, you also have a place where you can give. We're looking to come out with a number of uh things that we're trying to write right now. Um, and so if you can donate to that, uh, we're trying to to do a, a number of things of uh, showing the halakha of Yeshua in uh, in the Gospels um, and also his Hasidus as well. And so we're, we're trying to write those two things together. We just need the time. And so those are those are our projects, our singles project, and uh, also um, codifying, if you will, um, the halakha that we see Yeshua following. So. Wonderful, wonderful. All very exciting things. Well, David, brother, thank you for joining me for this. This has been an absolute pleasure. Again, we'll have to do this again sometime. Yeah. Um, before we sign off, as usual. L'chaim. L'chaim. <laughs>